Well, good evening and welcome everybody to Thursday Night Bible Study. Uh, my name is Lance Ivey. I am the pastor at Awaken Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. We're so grateful for you being with us this evening. And on these Thursday nights, uh, we have been going through uh, the book, Christ the Healer. So we're going to continue along those lines this evening. We're in chapter three, and we're going to be looking under the section that is titled Compassionate Love, Jesus's Ruling Motive. So uh, on these Thursday nights, and this is part 16, so this is Thursday, April the 28th, 2022, part 16, our goal is robust health. And uh, just want to draw your attention to a couple of those thoughts of the definition of robust health. Powerfully built, long-lasting, rugged, hardy, well-made, able to withstand or overcome adverse conditions. That's the level of health that we are living in. So under this section in the book, Compassionate Love, Jesus' Ruling Motive, we're going to read through some of the uh, sections of the book. And so uh, we're picking it up here on page 51 in the edition that I've got. Many through the years have been taught that Christ performed miracles of healing just to show his power and to prove his deity. To whatever measure of truth there may be to that, it is far from being all the truth as to why Jesus healed and worked miracles. He would not have had to heal all to show his power. Just a few outstanding cases would prove this. But the scriptures show that he healed because of his compassion and to fulfill prophecy. Others teach that he healed the sick to make himself known. But in Matthew 12, 15 and 16, we read, great multitudes followed him. Uh, and this was in connection to Isaiah's prophecy concerning him bearing our sicknesses. And, but this doesn't just refer only to his earthly ministry. This is the universal manifestation of his compassion. And not just uh, a momentary, hey, I feel sorry for you kind of thing. This is an enduring empathy, compassion that is never ending. His mercies are new every morning. And so his compassions are special and unique, but they are universal. And this is a revelation of the unchanging will of God when we see anything that is a demonstration of compassion in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that he only began to do and to teach. But this did not stop when he left the earth. And that there's the continuation that was augmented after his ascension. So you remember, uh, of course, uh, in the book of Acts, it says that Jesus appeared to them for 40 days after his resurrection. And he taught them things about how the kingdom of God works, taught them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Compassion is a kingdom core value. And so it's amazing how so often people will abdicate compassion and they lose sight of the heart and the nature of God and why he wants all to be healed and all to be well. Too often people are ready to have arguments about doctrine or arguments about, well, why didn't this happen or why did that happen? Now let's focus on the, the keeping, as I heard said before, let's keep the main thing the main thing. The compassion of God is really at this heart of why he wants everyone to be healed of every type of sickness, illness, or disease, and he wants everyone to be healed. See, that's not something that ended when Jesus left or when the last apostles. I mean, those are unnecessary arguments to get into. What we need to focus on is, are we releasing the compassion of God? Is it compassionate for you as a parent to allow your child to languish with some type of sickness or or disease. Won't you as a parent to everything within your ability, everything within your power, your capacity to try and get this, whatever it might be, this, this sickness or, or this affliction, this physical torment of any type, emotional torment of any type. Isn't it something that you or I or we as parents 
don't want our children to have to deal with. It, that's, that's parental compassion that's welling up within us. Well, we have the greatest parent because all good fathering, all good mothering, all good parenting comes from our good God. And it is his compassion that wells up anytime he sees any of his children or anyone in, uh, inundated with sickness or overwhelmed with sickness of any type or any kind of calamity or tragedy for that matter. It's the compassion of God that rushes in, just rushes in to overwhelm this calamity, this tragedy, this sickness, this illness, this weakness, these symptoms. His compassion wants to rush in and drive it out. See, that, that's, that's the heart of the Father. That's the core value within the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus taught while he was here in the earth, but also those 40 days, he's still teaching those. And then after the three years that he was here and he, he healed all that came to him, Jesus said, it is expedient. It's the word expedient means profitable. He said, it is profitable for you that I go away. Now, how could this be true? Jesus going away. How would this be true that it's profitable if his going away would modify or diminish his ministry to the sick, the ill, the diseased, the afflicted, the lame? How could that be profitable? Well, his idea of profitable was I won't have to be the only one. And now we can delegate, we can grow, we can multiply the number of labors. Isn't that what he prayed for in uh, Matthew chapter nine that we talked about last week? Remember when he deputized and equipped 12 and then the 70 beyond that? And then there were others beyond that that were delegated, that were equipped, that were deputized with this authority and this power to go and heal the sick. Well, the same thing is true now in our day. How many multitudes, multitudes upon multitudes of people that are now equipped or should be to minister healing, to release healing into the lives and hearts of those that are afflicted. See, that's why it would be profitable for Jesus to go away, because if only one person could have that measure of the spirit, that anointing like he had, then it You'd have to always go find out where he is. But what happens when you have many people, multitudes, who are filled and flooded with this presence and this power of God? I think it's so important that we take hold of that which is rightfully ours. So, I want you to, to continue here. I need to close the door. I'll be right back so that we can continue on this. So, okay, I'm here. And we are continuing. My apologies. I left the door open here that needed to be closed in order for us to, to make sure that the audio was, was uh, able to be heard. Clearly, so my apologies for that. But as we were saying, uh, this this profitable essence of what Jesus was saying is because of what he also prefaced in this promise. So anticipating the questions that this statement could bring up, that he was going to go away and it was expedient for him to go away and it would be profitable for for us, for him to go away. Anticipating the questions that this statement could bring up, Jesus prefaced his promise to continue the same and greater works in answer to our prayers after his, his exaltation with the words, verily, 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 I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. And... You know, the question would now naturally become, well, how are we to do them? Well, Jesus continues to answer the questions before they're actually voiced. He said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do. That my Father may be glorified, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's John 14, 12, and 13. 
And notice that statement, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do. Now, I've been taught in times past that, that the, the, the language here, this Greek phraseology and language, whatsoever you ask, that will I do. It's literally saying, whatever you ask, I'll, in my name, in my authority, in my influence, I will do it for you. And if it doesn't yet exist, I'll create it for you so that it can be done. So no matter what it is that we're facing, when we know what the Father has said, when we know what Jesus has said, when we know what the Spirit of God is speaking to us, and when we have scripture, we know the will of God. And we know that we are authorized. We have been given the power of attorney, the right to use his name the same way he used his authority in the earth. And Jesus delegating that authority the same way he did with the 12 and to the 70. And even how, how much more now that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We can use that name. And he said, if you'll ask, and, it, and literally it, it, it has the connotation of make a demand of me not demanding something that is not your right or not demanding to humble God. That's not what we're talking about. Placing a demand on what is rightfully yours. I mean, every time I go into the pantry in the house or the, the, the uh, refrigerator in the house, I can make a demand on the resources that are contained in the house because I own the resources. The, I own what's in the pantry, what's in the refrigerator. And consequently, I don't have to ask permission from some external source or anyone else in the house to what I bought, I can use. Well, Jesus bought it through, with his blood. The father provided it in his compassion. And so now he, and he delegated that to us as, as we have come to understand and said, in my name, now go in my name, go it with my authority. And you can do what I did the same way I did what the father told me, gave me to do. And he said, it's, it's not me, it's the father in me that's doing the works. And we can take that same thought. It's not us, it's the father in us, it's Jesus in us, it's the Holy Ghost in us. Now, you understand you still have to act on something. You still have to move your physical body to a place or you need to use your words. I, we understand that. But what's flowing out of us is that life that God put in us. It's that authority that Jesus has given to us. It's the power and the might of the Holy Spirit within us. That's what flows out of us. And he said that glorifies the Father. In the, that, and he said that at the end of John 14, 13, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, the Son is in us, and when we do the works that Jesus said we can do, asking the Father in his name, he will do it, and the Father will be glorified because the Son in us is doing these works. It's the Father in the Son and the Son in us and us in him the Holy, I mean, all of this starts wrapping it together and immersing together in such a way that it becomes clearly distinguished that it's the power of God. It is God in us doing these works. And notice he said, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go into my Father. That's why it's expedient, because all of you talking to his disciples and, and by connection, talking to us, will be able to do what I did and greater works than these. So in other words, we are to do them by asking him to do them. We are to do these works and greater works by asking him to do them and us yielding to this and him doing them through us because we are in him and he is in us. Notice he did not say less works or lesser works. He said the works and greater works. This promise is directly from the lips of Christ. 
And this promise is a complete answer to all opposers, to all the books, the articles, the YouTube videos, the any of the things, any of the, the, the statements, any of the messages that are given against divine healing. This is Jesus answering all of them. Listen, I, I'm not going to get into an argument with anyone. People can believe what they want to in regards to divine healing and divine health. And I'm not going to stop loving them. I'm not going to stop, you know, believing the best of, of people. But I'm not going to get into an argument about, well, is it really God's will or is it not? Is divine healing for us or not? Is divine health for us or not? When we have so many scriptures, so much truth, so many examples, and not only in the life and the ministry of Jesus demonstrated in the scriptures, but in the early church and then in the centuries after the church leading up to and including today's day. So that it doesn't benefit the individuals who are opposing divine healing. It doesn't benefit us to get into these entangled arguments about it. We're not arguing about it. We're just simply saying this is what we believe. We're going to stand on that based on scripture. And it's so important that that last part of the statement I said, based on scripture, not based on opinions, not based on circumstances, not based on perspective, not based on what our traditions have said, not based on the, these fathers or these mothers or this family member, or this preacher. No, not based on any of that. It's based on scripture. See, it's amazing that so often we find ourselves trying to defend a position when we have scripture for that. And then we ask, well, where's your scripture for this? And not just, you know, many times people like to consider, hey, you're just snatching this out of context and so forth. Well, no, we, remember last week we read about the every, the all, every sickness, illness, and disease. He healed them all. There were multiple verses. We understand that out of the mouth of two or three verse, two or three witnesses, let every matter be resolved and settled. We got more than two or three and didn't even give you all of them. And we not only used what was in the Gospels, in Matthew and Luke in particular, we could have looked at Mark, we could have looked at John, but also went into Acts, the book of Acts, towards the end of the book of Acts, so 30 years after essentially the beginning of the book of Acts. So my whole point is you never have to get into an argument or a disagreement with anyone about that, but even more so. Now listen carefully what I'm about to say. Even more so, you don't have to get into a contention within yourself about it. No, you have every right to divine healing and divine health. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to question, well, I, was I good enough? Or is my behavior? Am I disqualified? Am I qualified? Did I have I prayed enough? Have I? No, 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 no. It is not based on your working this. You don't have to work to get your healing. You labor to enter into rest, and that labor is fighting the good fight of faith. You stand your ground when you're prompted to do something a certain way, might be to confess something or to resist or reject something, to bind something, to lose something, to just express and release your faith about something, to rest in the grace of it. Whatever it might be, the Lord may direct you to drink more water or drink you know, less coffee. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I may have hurt somebody's feelings there. Don't, don't tune out. Don't get offended. But my point being that there are times the Lord may direct you. So that's the that's the good fight of faith that you are fighting. It's not if I do enough stuff, God will He'll be pleased with me and He'll heal me. No, you healing is already yours. You're fighting from a place of victory. You're fighting from a place of healing, not fighting from a place to get victory, to get healing. Are you listening to me? So, you know, just take the scriptures, stand on the scriptures. You don't have to get into arguments to, with opposition outside of yourself, nor opposition within yourself about, you don't need to contend in your own heart and say, well, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it, I don't know. No, no, no. Stay focused on what does the word say? What did Jesus say? What did the life of Jesus demonstrate? What did the ministry of Jesus demonstrate? What does the compassion of God say? What, what do we have? promise to us? What do we see in the Old Testament? What do we see in the New Testament? The Old Covenant, New Covenant. What's in the New Covenant? What's in the Old Covenant? Well, whatever we see in the Old Covenant about healing, and there's plenty in there, 
we have a new and better covenant established upon better promises. So anything that was available healing-wise in the old, the atonement, we talked about that, redemption, we talked about that, we'll talk more about those things. It's even better in this new dispensation, this new age of grace. Not this new age, new age of grace, new time, dispensation of grace. Are you listening to me? So we just need to know what the word says, what is written in the scriptures. What does the word say to us in our heart to direct us and to help us? And see, whenever we get the word of God, what is written, whenever we get what he speaks to us in our heart, that's the compassion of God. That's, and that's Jesus' motive for healing is rooted in compassion. So it is written. Find what is written. Stand on that. That is the compassion of God speaking through what is written. It is written was Christ's policy when resisting the devil. Since Christ said it is written and the devil said it is written. Remember, though, Jesus said it is also written. He knew how to counter the counterattack that would come from the enemy. But because it is written is what Jesus said. And because the devil would try to come back and say it is written. Preachers and people need to say it is written this is what the scripture says it is written it is written so that was the section in the book uh that was titled compassionate love jesus's ruling motive uh let's look at this last section before we close the wisdom of the early church because remember we said you know these things not only happened in the life and the ministry of jesus when he walked on the earth before he was crucified before his resurrection, but after his resurrection, these things took place in the early church. So in the section under the wisdom of the early church, the early church took Christ at his word and prayed unitedly for signs and wonders of healing until the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And then they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, they which were vexed with unclean spirits, they were healed, every one of them. I remember what we were saying last week. Jesus healed everything and all. Well, here's an example. After his resurrection, they were going through the streets of Jerusalem. And we see this in Acts chapter 3, 4, 5. They, they were still healing. And God was still healing. And Jesus, through the apostles, was still healing and through others was still healing. And he healed not just a few folks, and he healed not just a few minor situations, but it says that they brought sick folks from round about Jerusalem, multitude, a multitude out of the cities all around Jerusalem. And they just laid them in the streets, laid them on beds and couches. And it says that those that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one of them. So this is after the life and ministry and the death and the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. This is in the early church. And it didn't stop with the early church. There are plenty of writings. We won't get into all of those. We'll make comment on some of those. But in the early centuries of the early church, going beyond the lifespans of the apostles and even those who came after the apostles who who knew the apostles you go ge generations after them and there was still healing divine healing divine health and there was healing of every kind of sickness illness and disease and there was healing of alls all that were taking place healing every one of them so that is good news and that's something just to resonate, let resonate within you, because it'll reach all the way to you right now in the in this present moment, that this healing flow has never ceased, never stopped. Continuing the book, all that Jesus began to do and to teach, he was here continuing from the right hand of God through his body, the church, according to his promise. Uh, some have said that was only in the beginning of the book of Acts for the purpose of confirming their word regarding Christ's resurrection. Yet when you turn to the last chapter of Acts and read how 30 years later, 
after Paul on the island of Melita had healed the father of Publius, notice what it says of it, this story. All the other sick people in the island came and were cured. This is a Weymouth's translation or rendering of it. But notice what it says. All the other sick people in the island came and were cured, all of them, and were cured. Cured of what? Cured of whatever they had, every sickness, every disease. So we see in the very last chapter of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Ghost, we could call it. And, 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 and we would do no injustice to the scripture and to the truth. It was the Acts of the Holy Ghost through the disciples, through the apostles. But we see in this last chapter of the book of Acts, it is still the will of God to heal not just some, but to heal all. And that is still the truth today. It is God's will to heal not just some, but to heal all, all those who are watching, all those who will watch. It is God's will for you to be healed. Well, that's what we have for this evening. We're so grateful and appreciative of you being with us this evening. And so um, just wanna, wanna say to you that uh, we look forward to seeing you on Sunday, uh, 10 o'clock at uh, Awaken Church. Looking forward to a great time in the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. And come expecting, come believing, come expecting. If you're watching online, come believing, come expecting. God has yet many great things to do in your life. And he wants you to experience it. And he wants you to experience it now. Amen. Well, God bless you. We love you. And we will see you next time.